Every now and then, something comes along that upends the way we understand an historical event. Now, I'll be honest, this video is not about one of those things. We're talking about the number of blades on Titanic's central propeller, because this has been heavily debated online thanks to some very interesting evidence that emerged in the 2000s. For decades, the understanding had been that Titanic's central propeller, the one in the middle here, had four blades. It was an assumption made because her near-identical sister ship, the Olympic, had the same setup. But a single digit recorded in a long-lost notebook changed everything. It's an interesting little story that won't change the way we see the Titanic disaster, but it does teach us some interesting things about Edwardian engineering and daring do. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to take a closer look at Titanic's propellers. So, where to begin? Well, let's talk propellers. We all kind of know what they do. They act as a kind of screw. In fact, that's why in Titanic's day they were mostly actually called screws. By angling the blades, the propeller's motion essentially acts like Archimedes' screw, an invention from around 210 BC. As if to emphasize the similarity, many early propellers were actually just giant screws that, when rotating, pulled the ship forward through the water. Propellers like this were big and clunky. Engineers had figured out in the 19th century that by adding individual blades to a central fixed hub, you could essentially emulate the motion of a screw and then eliminate the overly long and complicated body of the older style of propeller. By the time Titanic came along, the understanding of the science behind how propellers work had improved dramatically, but it still wasn't exact. Nowadays, we have complicated computer software that can help us predict how propellers will behave, but back then it was a game of trial and error, and often they didn't get things exactly right. Let's take a look at why propellers were so difficult to get right in the first place. Hydrodynamics is a complicated study. It looks closely at how bodies act underwater. Everything from the shape of the propeller to the number of its blades, their angles, all of it can drastically impact the way a ship will behave as it cuts its way through the ocean. Engineers were in a constant battle between two factors. Efficiency and vibration. Maritime researcher Robert Reed wrote a great article about this, I'll put a link in the description below. He put it best when he said, for a given total propeller blade area, the fewer the number of blades, the more efficient the propeller. Also, for a given total propeller blade area, the more blades, the less vibration is created. When we mention propeller efficiency in this context, we're talking about the point at which the propeller's peak performance can be reached before additional factors and impacts cause it to drop off. A journal about propellers by Mercury Marine, a boat engine company, explains that technically, a single bladed propeller would be the most efficient, but the vibration would be absolutely intolerable. The more blades you add to a propeller, efficiency begins to decrease, but so does the vibration. So the design of a ship's propeller is a big game of compromise, a battle to perfect the form and shape of the blades and then balance the number of blades so your propellers are working at their best without shaking the milk out of your passenger's tea. Sometimes, engineers got this balance wrong. Probably the most famous among shaky ships was the Lusitania. She was launched in 1906 with four three-bladed propellers with very wide blades. The propellers were a compromise in the designer's minds to offer the most efficiency with the least vibration. But, of course, the elements combined to create a very shaky ship indeed. Lusitania's early career was marred by intense vibration as the propellers did their thing. So much so that in 1909, she had them replaced with new, sleeker, four-bladed models. It reduced the vibration significantly and helped Lusitania reach even greater speeds. Harland and Wolff, Titanic's builders, were not out to smash the speed record with Olympic and Titanic, but they did want them to be efficient. It's evident in the ship's power plant, a hybrid setup of triple expansion steam engines and a central turbine designed to squeeze every bit of power out of the steam that they possibly could. Now we covered this in a video a few months ago. Suffice it to say, Titanic's designers were putting a lot of thought into how their ships would behave and how much fuel they would burn in order to maintain their demanding schedules across the Atlantic. So it was that in 1911, Olympic went into service with two different propeller types. Her two outboard screws with three large blades each 
had a diameter 23 feet 6 inches across, or around 7.2 meters, and her single central propeller sitting inside an aperture, or a kind of cutout, in the hull. This one was driven by the central turbine, and it featured four blades around 16 feet 6 inches, or 5 meters across. Presumably, the design of the central propeller, with its unique four-bladed arrangement, was chosen as it represented a solid compromise between efficiency and vibration. I wonder if Harland and Wolfe looked at Cunard's issues with their turbine-powered Lusitania and her three-bladed propellers, and decided on a four-bladed prop out of fear of vibration. Of course, the more blades generally means the least vibration. Every photo we have of Olympic from the time shows her central prop very clearly. But believe it or not, no photo of Titanic's propellers exists. Every one of them that is often labelled as Titanic in books and documentaries is actually the Olympic. So, for decades, it was just assumed that Titanic had copied Olympic's arrangement. But, in the 2000s, a very interesting little discovery was made. In 2008, historian Mark Chernside published an article that pointed out a tiny detail in an engineer's handbook from Harland and Wolfe. It showed all the various ships on the stocks at the time, details of their propellers, the size of them, and the number of blades. And clearly, marked under Titanic's central propeller is the number three. Now, a lot of people online have a hard time dealing with this. They have an image in their minds of what Titanic looked like. Virtually every movie, painting, and model kit up to that point had shown Titanic with a four-bladed central prop. And almost like a kind of deep-seated religious belief, many people refused to change their minds. Now, one popular argument was that it was a simple typo or a mistake that the engineer had meant to write four instead of three. But the evidence, especially the context of the time, points very much to the contrary. Remember we mentioned that Lusitania had her propellers swapped out in 1909? Well, this kind of thing was very common at the time. In the never-ending battle to balance efficiency and vibration, shipyards tested and changed their ship's propellers all the time. Olympic had gone into service with her four-bladed central prop, and it performed extremely well. There was barely any noticeable vibration at all for the passengers. So it stands to reason that Harland and Wolfe might want to try something a little different on the next sister ship to see if they could squeeze even more efficiency and power out of their design. By fitting Titanic with a three-bladed central prop, Harland and Wolfe could directly compare the two ships' fuel consumption, their speeds and vibration, to see which design worked the best. It's not a silly concept. In fact, in 1911, they had tried this kind of arrangement on another ship, the Aberdeen Line's SS Demosthenes. The arrangement here looks strikingly similar to Olympics, except for the addition of a three-bladed central propeller. It's not ridiculous to think that Harland and Wolfe were trying something new with Titanic, but the experiment failed because, of course, Titanic never made it to her intended destination. The real smoking gun that essentially proves Titanic was carrying a different kind of propeller is what Harland and Wolfe did next. In March 1913, Olympic was fitted with her own central three-bladed prop. Clearly, the results were poor, though, because by 1920, she had reverted to a four-bladed type again, and her sister ship Britannic was built with the same kind. In fact, Olympic went through a handful of different blade types with propellers of all different pitches and widths. She ended up with very wide 36 foot 9 inch diameter main outboard props over her original 23 foot 6 inch models. In fact, over her career, she went through at least four different kinds of main outboard and three different kinds of central propeller. Harland and Wolfe were constantly experimenting. It's a great representation of the spirit of the age where engineers and designers tried many different methods to improve on their work. Today, Titanic's central propeller is still on the ship. It's just tantalizingly out of reach, buried under tons of seafloor silt. We'll never see it again, and no photos are known to exist. But were we to raise the ship's battered stern section, we'd most likely see a three-bladed propeller sitting there. It's a reminder of all of the thought and work that was put into making the ship as good as she possibly could be, and it's a sad reminder of the fact that she never lived up to her full potential. <laughs>